Hey there, in this video we're going to talk about the limit of piecewise functions. And so here we have this piecewise function and the split point is 5 and so that makes sense that then we want to find the limit as x goes to 5 from the left, 5 as x goes to 5 from the right, and then the two-sided limits. So we did some piecewise functions when we were talking about one-sided limits. So I'm just going to review some of that using a graph, but then also I'm going to show you how to find this these limits without even having to graph the function. Um, okay, so let's look at the graph first, and then I'll show you how to do it without graphing. All right, so here we have the graph of the function. So when x is less than or equal to 5, we look like the radical. And because it's 5 minus x, it's our usual radical um, reflected about the y-axis. So we have the, the usual square root function just going the opposite way. And then when x is greater than 5 and not including 5, that's why we have a hole there in the graph, we look like the line y equals 2x. So this is y equals 2x, and this is y equals the square root of 5 minus x. All right, so as x goes to 5 from the left, what is the limit? Let me write that over here. The limit as x goes to 5 from the left of f of x, then we are looking at as x goes to 5 from the left. So you're approaching 5 from the left of 5. So if you're to the left of 5, you're smaller than 5. So that's another way to think about it. So you're approaching 0. So that limit is 0. Now without the graph, when I look at this, we say the limit as x goes to 5 from the left, we kind of go over the same sort of um, thought process. Okay, if you're coming from the left of 5, that means you're smaller than 5. So then without the graph, you will look at the function. Okay, when you're left of 5, you're smaller than 5. So when you're following the function, the square root of 5 minus x. So that means that I, for this limit, I'm really looking at the limit as x goes to 5 of the square root of 5 minus x. And, right, with any limit, you just take the value and plug it in. If you get a number, you're done. 5 minus 5 is 0, the square root of 0 is 0. So I'm done. So notice that graphically and algebraically, you get the same, same limit. Um, so what about the limit as x goes to 5 from the right of f of x? From the graph, I can see that that looks like it's going to 10. So I can say the limit is 10. Right? Even though it's open there, it doesn't. I'm not asking for f of 5, right, f of 5 will be 0, this is where it's defined. The limit is just what are you, what are the y values getting close to? Um, so if I want to do, do it without the graph, I will say, okay, the limit as x goes to 5 from the right means, okay, if I am to the right of 5, that means I am greater than 5. So I look at my function, and I look for, oh, greater than 5, I'm following the function y equals 2x. So then this is the same thing as saying the limit as x goes to 5 of 2x. And same thing. I take my 5, plug it in for x, and so I will have 2 times 5, which is 10. So notice that we get the exact same limit. So if you have the graph, you just go by looking at the graph. Right? What are you getting close to? From either side. But if you don't have the graph, you look at your coming from the left means you're less than 5, coming from the right means you're greater than 5, and that's how you approach the function. Uh, now what about the two-sided limit? Are the left-sided and the right-sided limit the same? So what I know is that the limit as x goes to 5 from the left of f of x is 0, and the limit as x goes to 5 from the right of f of x is 10. These are not the same. Therefore, what can I say? The limit as x goes to 5, the two-sided limit of f of x, does not exist. In order for the limit to exist, the left-sided limit and the right-sided limit have to be the same. Let's try another example. Oh, and by the way, graphically, the two-sided limit, you can see right away that they don't coincide. They're not the same, the left-sided and right-sided limit. So the, the two-sided limit does not exist as soon as I see that jump in the graph. 
the limit does not exist. All right, let's try this example. Find the indicated limits. Limit as x goes to 0 and the limit as x goes to pi. So why are we looking at those values, 0 and pi? Well, notice this piecewise function is made, is made of three pieces. And we're looking at when x is less than 0, and then when x is between 0 and pi, including those, and then when x is greater than pi. All right, so for a limit to exist, for a two-sided limit to exist, I need to make sure that um, the right-sided limits exist. And because this is a piecewise function, and I have the risk of that split um, having a jump in the graph, so I could have something like this, which will mean that the limit does not exist. So I need to look at the one-sided limits. So let's do that. So we need to look at the limit as x goes to 0 from the left, and as it goes to 0 from the right. If those are the same, then the two-sided limit will exist. Okay, so we are going to do this without the graph. And so we're going to follow the steps that we did for that previous problem. And so I look at this and I'm like, okay, when I'm approaching 0 from the left, what does being to the left of 0 mean? If you are to the left of 0, what are you? Are you smaller than 0 or greater than 0? Um, then x left, x left to 0 means x is less than 0. So I'm going to look at the portion of the piecewise function where x is less than 0. So that means I'm looking at y equals negative 1. So that means that the limit as x goes to 0 from the left of f of x is the same thing as looking at the limit as x goes to 0 of the constant function negative 1. So there's no x to plug in. This is a constant function, so the limit as x goes to 0 is just negative 1, right? So think about what, what that means. y equals negative 1. What does that function look like? I'm going to freehand it here. Um, so this is negative 1. y equals negative 1, right? So we're asking as x goes to 0, um, as we approach 0, what are the y values doing? They're all the y values are always going to be negative 1. So as x goes to 0, it's going to stay negative 1. So that's my value, then my limit as x goes to 0 from the left. Now the limit as x goes to 0 from the right of f of x. Now we are no longer looking at that function. Right? As x goes to 0 from the right, I'm going to look at, OK, if x is to the right of 0, that means x is greater than 0. So I'm going to look at the portion of the function where x is greater than 0. So x is greater than 0 for that middle function, cosine x. So looking for the limit as x goes to 0 from the right of f of x is the same thing as looking for the limit as x goes to 0 of cosine of x. Right? That is my x greater than 0 function. So in this case, I'm following y equals cosine x. So I'm going to find that limit. And with limits, I would just plug it in. I would have done that here, except there's no x to plug in. So it's always the y value is always negative 1, regardless of the x. So that's why we get negative 1. But here, I do have an x, so I can plug it in. So this is going to be cosine of 0, which is what? Cosine of 0 is 1. Are they the same? No, right? So I have the limit as x goes to 0 from the left is negative 1, but the limit as x goes to 0 from the right is positive 1. So my left-sided and right-sided limits are not the same. Therefore, the limit as x goes to 0, the two-sided limit of f of x, does not exist. Now let's do the same thing for pi. Now, for pi, we're also looking at the two-sided limit. And now we have the, because pi is the split point for these, the middle and the bottom function. So when x is less than pi, we look like y equals cosine x. And when x is greater than pi, we look like y equals x minus pi squared. So let's go take a look at that. 
So for the two-sided limit, the limit as x goes to pi of f of x, we're going to do the same thing. Look at one-sided limits. If they are the same, then that's the limit. If they're different, like they were for 0, then the limit does not exist. So let's look at the limit as x goes to, z, to pi from the left first of f of x. And let's try the same logic, right? So as, as x goes to pi from the left, so if x is to the left of pi, what does that mean? If you are to the left of pi, you're smaller than pi, so less than pi. So I'm going to look at the part of the function where x is less than pi. So I'm following cosine x. So the limit as x goes to pi from the left means I'm looking at the limit as x goes to pi of just cosine x. And with any limit, I plug it in. So I'm going to get cosine of pi, which is negative 1. Now let's look at the right-sided limit. The limit as x goes to pi from the right of f of x. If you are to the right of pi, so if x is to the right of pi, that means x is larger than pi. So I'm going to be looking at the portion of the piecewise function that tells me x is larger than pi. So x is greater than pi in the bottom function. So x minus pi quantity squared. So I'm looking at the limit as x goes to pi of x minus pi squared. Plug in x equals pi, right? That means you're taking the limit. Notice that as I plug in, as I evaluate at pi, my limit notation goes away. So I have pi minus pi squared, and that is 0. Are they the same? Nope. So therefore, we can say the limit as x goes to pi, the two-sided limit, does not exist because neither of them were the same. So this is a way of doing um, piecewise function limits without having to do the graph. And especially for something like this, right? Like if you, you might be intimidated by graphing that, maybe, maybe not. Um, the functions are not too bad. y equals negative 1, that's a constant function. y equals cosine x. And we're only graphing it between 0 and pi. And then this is a parabola shifted over to the right pi units, right? So that's why um, this kind of makes sense. And so if you wanted to look at the graph, um, you can certainly graph it. So looking at the graph, um, so this is what our graph, that function will look like, right? So when x is less than zero, you look like y equals negative one, the constant function. So this is y equals negative 1 for x is less than 0. And then when you're between 0 and pi, okay, so this is pi, um, you are cosine of x. This is y equals cosine x when x is between 0 and pi. And then this is y equals, what was it, x minus pi squared. So notice as a parabola shifted over to the vertex of pi when x is greater than pi. And so uh, from the graph, now you can see, oh, these are definitely the limit as you go to 0. The two-sided limit is not going to exist because they're the one-sided limits are not the same. Same towards pi. But sometimes the graphs are not so friendly to get, and so I wanted to show you how to find the limit still without having to draw the graph. Um, let's try an example, and I'm just going to add this one, so it may or may not be in your notes. Um, so let's say let f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 3 over x minus 3. So notice that then 3 is not in the domain of the function, right? So let's find the limit as x goes to 3 of f of x. So there are three ways that you could um, do this limit. You could use a table of values to, to figure out what is, it, what is it doing close to 3, right? To the left of 3, to the right of 3. So you could do a table of values. You could try to figure out the graph. or then you can do it without the graph. And in, in fact, in order to do it with 
with the graph, you still need to know the algebraic properties of absolute value. So uh, maybe I should have started with the review of what is absolute value. So what do you know about the absolute value of x as a piecewise function? The absolute value of x, right, is defined to be x when x is greater than or equal to zero and it's negative x when x is less than zero. And I talked about this in one of the earlier videos. Um, so that is, so the absolute value of x becomes a piecewise function. So what do you think the absolute value of x minus three is going to be? Right, the absolute value of x, and if you look at the graph, this is the v, right? So you have here, this is y equals x, when x is greater than zero, and then this is y equals negative x, when x is less than zero. So what does the graph of x minus three look like? The absolute value of x minus three is the same v, it's just shifted over to three. So we have that v. So what does that mean then about the, the piecewise function? Right? So then the piecewise function for x minus three is that it is x minus three, right? You just drop the absolute value when x is greater than three or equal to. And it's gonna be negative x, right? The negative, negative x minus three when x is, oops, x greater than when x is less than three. So that is our definition of absolute value. Now for this particular function, so with f of x being absolute value of x minus three over x minus three, now what does that mean? Now the domain, x can't be three, right? So when I have this part of the function, I will get rid of the equals. So I know the, I'm going to bring in my definition of the absolute value of x minus 3 then. So the, I know the absolute value of x minus 3 is x minus 3 when x is, I'm going to just say greater than 3. And I have this, right, my denominator is still there. So that is the same denominator. And I'm just using my definition of the absolute value of x minus 3 to create the piecewise function. The absolute value is what's making it be piecewise. So negative x minus 3 over x minus 3 when x is um, less than 3. And so now, right, and this x minus 3 again is my same denominator. So that hasn't changed. But what is x minus 3 over x minus 3? That's just 1, right? So f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 3 over x minus 3 is really just a function one, x minus three derivative of x minus three is one, when x is greater than three, and negative x minus three over x minus three, those cancel. Yeah. Negative one, when x is less than three. And so now when I look at the limit, so the limit as x goes to three from the left of f of x, when x is, to the left of three, that means you're smaller than three, so x is less than three. So it's this part, x is less than three. So my limit is negative one. And when the limit as x goes to three from the right of f of x, that means that when I am to the right of three, I'm greater than three. So I'm looking at the top function, which is one. Not the same. So I say, so therefore the limit as x goes to three of x minus 3 over x minus 3 does not exist. The two-sided limit does not exist, but the one-sided limits definitely. The left side goes to negative 1, the right side goes to 1. And so when you graph this function, um, x minus 3 over x minus 3, right, the graph of this function, it looks like when x is greater than, oops, 3, <laughs> not 0, is going to look like the line y equals 1, and when x is less than 3, you're going to look like the line y equals negative 1. Pretend that plus negative 1. And so that's what our functions look like. And if you graph the same for the absolute value of x over x, is essentially this with this jump at 
x equals 0. If you do the absolute value of x plus 4 over x plus 4, it will look just like this, but the jump will be at x equals negative 4. So hopefully this helps in looking at those crazy functions that you'll be seeing in your homework. They're not crazy. They're just, they are encourage you, encouraging you to remember the definition of absolute value. An absolute value function is a piecewise function. Okay. And um, I'll end there. You know me if you have any questions.